Uh, our guest on the program is the House Majority Leader, Eric House Soder, former House Finance Chairman, former Vice Chair of House uh, the House uh, Finance Committee as well. Good morning, Eric. Great to have you with us. Hey, good morning, Rob. And let me tell you, last week, Bill and John, they did a great job. They held the fort down. They did a good job all week last week. So Hornby's, you should be proud of He them. sent me uh, a gift with a uh, ticking clock, like your time is limited here. I will, <laughs> I will say, Bill, uh, I guess uh, Saturday I moved my grass bill, yeah. mm -hmm. and Bill was telling a story about uh, yellow jackets. And the whole time I was mowing some high grass, I kept praying, Dear Lord, I hope I don't run into a yellow jacket. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I had a rough time last week and this weekend. Because of Gilstrap posting the yeah, show? No, 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 of Yellow Jacket. You're just and, brutal and, today. And just, let me, let me, this is, this is serious, folks. This is, and, Eric, I found two more hives in the lawn Ooh. beside the hive. To, uh, to, at yeah. least I'm fortunate I found the Yellow Jackets before they found me. And, yeah, uh, so, right, exactly. Man, they're out this exactly. year and with a vengeance. They're more than I've ever it's, seen It's too dry. I mean, yeah. usually when it's real dry like that, yeah. you'll see them. I'll tell you. Serious I'm, question: Could it be an extension of the same hive? Could it just be one great big hive? No, they different queens. Okay. Different queens. Yeah. yeah. I was digging out an old rose bush a few years ago and put a shovel right into a hive, and uh, that was not fun. They chased me up the street, got under my shirt. They were angry. Yeah, and kind of a <laughs> a, a continuation of that. I, I may have mentioned this last week. Uh, I've always seen yellow jackets in one, two, three, or four, generally when they're chasing me. But when <laughs> when I found the uh, last week this hive, they came out in thousands, and that yes. has burned them itself in my mind. I'm visioning these thousands of yellow jackets. One's bad enough, but when they're hundreds and a thousand, it's a frightening sight. That's an angry bee. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Eric, uh, household yeah. our guest on the program, and Eric, uh, also uh, a, uh, a genius HVAC guy. Uh, Eric, I know you're kind of in semi-retirement right now, but uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk you up here because I've, I've, had, uh, I've gone through HVAC people in the past. When I've had problems, it's always get a new system, get a new system, get a new system, and no one ever telling me why I have to get a new system right. in regards to what's breaking it down. And uh, I had some AC problems this year, and Eric uh, actually spent a uh, a good couple of weeks identifying the problem, then fixing the problem, as opposed to let's just replace the whole system. Uh, there were some issues that were causing my system to break over the years that nobody ever explored, and you did. You're the man. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. Try to save you money. That's my motto. You know. Well, thank so, you. Appreciate most, that. Most yeah. people don't find filters that exotic. <laughs> <laughs> Let me interrupt very quick. I just got on text. Uh, uh, Michael Height's mother said, careful, Stubble Phil. I take protecting my cubs very seriously. So, <laughs> so I'm going to watch what I say. Mama bear. <laughs> By the way, Donna, Donna, honest Donna Schaffner uh, came to your defense, uh, Bill, too, saying that you were just doing quality control testing to make sure the brownies weren't poisonous. That's right. Thanks, Donna. You're, you're a wonderful person. She's, that's why she's a sweetheart. That's right. And, and you've known and worked with Donna over the years. Why don't you pick up some of those crates, Rob? <laughs> <laughs> Skips a generation in my family. I don't know. It just doesn't seem to sink in. Uh, Eric, let's talk about the state's numbers after the fiscal sure. year ended June the 30th. They were very healthy numbers. And uh, if you want to give me some specifics, uh, go right ahead. I think the budget surplus was $1.8 billion. Yes. Yes. So like you stated, the fiscal year ending June uh, 2023, for the month of June, we ended with a $127 million surplus. So total revenue for the whole entire year, starting July 1 of 2022, ending June 30th of 2023, the total revenue for the year was $6,483,291,002. Two dollars is my contribution. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, the revenue estimates, uh, the, the state uh, uh, revenue, uh, uh, they projected or estimated four billion six hundred and thirty six million and twenty four thousand, which gave us a one billion eight hundred and forty seven million two hundred and sixty seven thousand dollars surplus. Now, um, as I've stated many times on this show, our our enrolled fiscal year twenty four budget bill uh, that we just passed, House Bill twenty twenty four, this past session. It had in the back of the budget in uh, Section 9, uh, the legislature decided to spend $1 billion, $1.1 billion 
of this surplus. So that leaves us a surplus remaining of $681,789,000. So that's where we're at right now. Now, um, personal income tax was a little off for the month of uh, June. It was off by $9 million. Consumer sales tax was up over estimates. It was up uh, $34 million. A severance tax came in a lot higher. It was $26 million over estimates. And the corporate net income tax also came $53 million over estimates. So those three taxes brought in about $113 million of that $127 million uh, surplus for the month of June. So all in all, the state uh, did very well for fiscal year 23. Poppy had a commentary he wrote on uh, the Metro News website page that said that the numbers aren't as rosy as they appear because a lot of these numbers were front-loaded, front-end numbers from the beginning of the year that were fading toward the end, Eric. Do you agree with his statement on that? I don't, because I went back and I looked at the revenue estimates. If you go back starting July 1 of 2022 up until June 30th, every month we collected more in revenue uh, than what we had estimated, except for two months. The month of November 2022, we had estimated $169 million on personal income tax. We only generated 158 for that month, so we were about $11 million off. And then for the month of June, of uh, June 30th of this year, we had estimated $209 million, but we only brought in 200 So for the year in personal income tax, we had estimated $2.1 billion, but we brought in $2.6 billion. So we brought in more revenue on the personal income tax. And you've heard me state several times that every year we see about $150 to $200 million just in natural revenue growth. Well, here we we definitely exceeded it, and uh, that's why I've been stating time and time again we need to give more money back to the West Virginia taxpayer. Eric, with a severance tax, uh, we get yes. a tax from coal, gas, lumber. Are there others as well besides those three big ones? We've eliminated the one on salt. We've okay. reduced the severance tax on coal, on steam coal. But uh, the big ones are natural gas, oil, and coal. Um, timber, timber brings in a little bit. But uh, we also, like I said, we had salt, but we eliminated it. It was only like... I think less than two million dollars a year, uh, but uh, no, your your coal, your 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 uh, gas, and your oil, coal and gas is the biggest ones. Yeah. Okay. And, and the like I said, we brought in over eight hundred million. Normally, we only bring in about three hundred fifty million, four hundred million a year. So. You know, we're bringing in more severance tax revenue as well. Yeah. My my question was predicated on the fact that through the years, the severance tax has uh, has been quite volatile. Years, uh, uh, quite a bit. Other years, much less so. Uh, looking at these that we get from, is it projection they will stay, stay healthy? Or how do you really judge uh, how healthy and robust severance tax will be? Well, with high inflation, the severance tax is going to stay healthy because high inflation, remember, the government makes more money. Severance taxes will go up. Uh, so so I, I, you know, I, I continue to see next year the same indication. You're going to bring in more than what we normally collect in severance tax, like I said, around 350 to $400 million a year. Uh, you could be collecting 600 again, $700 million. So, uh, no, I, I expect it to also come in quite higher than what it normally comes in. So it's tied to inflation as much as anything? Well, I'm just saying as the price of coal goes up and oil and gas goes up because inflation, yes, you're going to generate more revenue. You're going to bring in more money. So if that makes sense. Yes, it does. does. Sales tax, same way, you know, Mm -hmm. as prices go up, sales tax goes up, you know, so. John Gilstrap. Good morning, Eric. Um, so morning. we have a, a real financial surplus of $681 million. That goes into mm-hmm. a pile of money that already has how much of surplus money waiting to be distributed? Well, remember, the $1.8 billion, of that $1.8 billion, $1.1 is already allocated or appropriated in the budget bill. That leaves you the remaining $681 million. Now, We'll probably have a special session here in August uh, if we can come to some agreement on how that money is being spent. I've heard different stories. Uh, I've heard some 
of this money will go into rainy day fund. Uh, some will go into uh, highway paving projects, maybe do something for volunteer fire departments, maybe do something for uh, uh, corrections, but none of that's been decided on as of yet that I'm aware of. So what is the rainy day fund? I mean, it seems like it's it, mm -hmm. we're ready for a monsoon now in the rainy day fund, aren't well, we? Well, the rainy day fund was started in 1994, and then I think last year, we uh, actually stopped putting money in. And just for your listeners, just for a history lesson, uh, as we um, – every year at the end of June 30th, whatever the, whatever the surplus was at the end of the year, we were mandated by state law to put half of that money into a rainy day fund, and the other half would go into uh, general revenue. Now, as of June 30th of this year, our rainy day fund had $873 million in it. So last year we passed a bill that stated, I, I keep thinking Senate Bill 687, say either 687 or six, Senate Bill 647. We passed a bill that stated we no longer need to put money into the rainy day fund as long as our appropriations uh, are at 20% of the rainy day fund. So if you go back and look at the budget bill that we passed for this session, uh, we passed a budget bill that had $4.8 billion in spending. Well, 20% of that, $974 million. So if you take $974 million, and you heard me say we only have $873 million in it now, so theoretically the legislature would have to put in $100 million to keep it at that 20% level. We have like the fourth best rainy day fund in the nation, so we're doing re really well. Eric, you mentioned several things that you might consider spending money for. You did not mention broadband. Is that a the reason that we're going to get a large influx of federal dollars to address the broadband problem? Yes, with twelve with twelve billion dollars coming our way, I don't think we need to worry yeah. about spending any state dollars right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Eric Halsoder, um, our guest here. Did you have more to answer on that, Eric? Before I cut you no, off? No, 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 no. 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 Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about triggers then for the next round of state income tax cuts, uh, potentially 10 percent. And you may have heard during the intro leading up the interview from uh, a few weeks back uh, with Eric Tarr, the Senate finance chairman. that He felt that the triggers had been met to kick in the next round of state income tax cuts. Do you agree with that? And if so, tell me what I the do. triggers are. I, I do. And I haven't looked at the CPI number. Remember, we look at the CPI number. And we subtract that, and we, we convert that, and we subtract that from the base year of 2019, and that's our multiplier. And then if we take that multiplier and we multiply it by our, our uh, revenue, and if our revenue exceeds 2019, then you can see up to a 10% reduction. And a 10% so, reduction, Eric, costs the state how much? A 10% is usually about $250 million is the rule, you know, the rule, uh, you know, gotcha. a, a guess guesstimate. Now, you know, uh, of this six hundred and eighty-one million dollars surplus, I would li love to see us take another two hundred and fifty million dollars and put it back into uh, the income tax reserve fund. That's another thing. This income tax reserve reserve fund. I'll get it out of here. I'm mm -hmm. talking too quickly. The income tax reserve fund. Uh, this past session, we. Uh, uh, of that $1.1 billion surplus, the legislature decided to hold back $400 million and put it into that income tax reserve fund. Uh, that'll give us uh, a little breathing room, and it also will give us the ability to also lower taxes even more if we so desire. So I would love to see, John, you asked the $681 million. Maybe we could take some of that and also bank it towards that income tax reserve fund uh, get it up to about six hundred, seven hundred million dollars. That would give us a lot of uh, breathing room uh, in case uh, we start hitting these triggers every year. And um, what's the? And also, would give us. Go ahead. What's the time frame for doing that calculation and making an official decision on whether or not there will be an additional tax cut? It, it's, it starts here in August. The, the CPI numbers come out in June, July, I believe, in July. The, uh, the the revenue secretary will, will review the CPI numbers. And then in August, I think it's by August 15th, a decision is made. And uh, there you go. 
Eric. So remember, it's up to 10%. It doesn't have to be. It could be only 5%. If you have 5 or 6% inflation right now, uh, then you would only see a 4% income tax cut. Eric, uh, last session, you you and your colleagues did a great job of reducing the rate with income tax. But what you did not do was look at some of the structural changes, such as a marriage tax. Will that be mm. revisited sometime in the future, or do you have any optimism that we could actually do away with a marriage tax penalty? It needs to be looked at, uh, Bill, and I don't disagree with you. Uh, but let's see if economic theory is right. Economic theory states that if you want more of something, you have to tax less of it. So we're going to put economic theory to the test. Now, keep in mind, if in the event in the next three, four years, we are reducing every year by 10 percent, then by all means, there's no sense to even worry about the marriage penalty because at some point you're going to eliminate it. You, you see what I'm saying? Sure. You're just reducing the taxes each year. But uh, now if we go several years and we're only doing meager cuts of 2 or 3%, then, yes, I would agree with you. We need to revisit and uh, maybe do something. Eric, if that makes sense to you. Yes, it does, Eric. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Uh, so, I, you know, you make a good point in differentiating. I, I thought that these cuts would come in 10% increments, and you're saying that's not necessarily the case. It's up to 10%. Yes, we base it off of inflation because, uh, keep in mind, uh, as inflation increases, the legislature would have an ability to uh, obviously uh, cover their, no more no more spending than than five percent in the budget. So I, I left a little wiggle room. And if you remember, we talked about this. I was actually sitting in studio talking about this. We uh, we left a little wiggle room to maybe do up to five percent in pay raises. Mm -hmm. But that's the maximum amount of spending that you would be able to do. So if the legislature elected to do 5% pay raises, well, then you would have a 5% income tax cut. If the legislature decided not to do pay raises, then you could have up to 10% income tax cut. But it all would depend on the inflation rate. As inflation goes higher, um, obviously you're going to be bringing in more money. Uh, you would have decisions to make. There's nothing that would prevent a future legislature from changing that 10 percent and maybe changing it to 15 or 20 percent. So we have options, but uh, you have the, the way the bill was written, you would have up to a 10 percent income tax cut per year. Eric, when the state does pay raises for state employees, mm -hmm. is that a, across the board by by statute yeah. or can it be selectively done? Targeting, say, teachers. It could, be, it could be selectively done, but uh, normally what we do is we do them across the board. And when we do it across the board, you're talking about a $230 million base building. That's roughly what a 5% pay raise across the board does. Uh, but there's nothing preventing you from going in and saying, hey, I want to pay correctional officers uh, a $30,000 bump if you want it or a $10,000 bump, whatever. You could go in and select selectively choose uh, which ones that you want to give a pay raise to. And, and that's probably what you're going to see during this special session with the uh, discussions with corrections. You're going to see some structural changes, and you probably will see a pay raise um, coming out of it as well. When was the last pay raise? Just past session. Yeah. Okay. Also yes. 5%? Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, we've done four pay raises in the last five years, if I'm not mistaken, so – and they've all been 5%. If I remember, about a year ago, the governor staff, uh, maybe it was through Dave Hardy, did a revenue projection for surpluses going forward. And he said over the next three years, surpluses would be over a billion dollars and may maybe even uh, higher, uh, like the 1.8 range like we had this year, Eric. Uh, do you recall that? And do you still feel like that could be the situation? Yeah, if you continue to keep a flatline budget, and, and the beauty of a flatline budget, and, and I know uh, there's some of your listeners will say that, hey, the revenue estimates aren't being um, the exact number. Well, keep in mind, a revenue estimate is just an estimate. But let's just assume that this $1.8 billion surplus, uh, people will argue, well, the revenue estimates weren't high enough. Well, let's assume that that was in the budget. The governor did hit the revenue estimates exactly. Remember, the legislature then would have got a budget from the governor 
that stated $6.4 billion, and all $6.4 billion was subject to legislative appropriations. So here we're able to, by having a flatline budget, we're able to control the rate of spending, use the money on one-time expenditures, not base building. Now, obviously, pay raises are base building. But it also gives us a wiggle room to reduce the spending, like I said. Now, when the legislature decided to put $400 million back in a reserve, in a personal income tax reserve fund, you just eliminated $400 million of spending. So it gives you the opportunity, if you're serious about lowering taxes, lowering corporate net income taxes, um, uh, lowering you know, the personal, uh, not only the personal income tax, but uh, real property taxes as well, that's how you're going to be able to, to do it. Keep in mind, once the surpluses are built into the budget, it's much harder for the legislature to get that money out of uh, the budget bill, if that makes sense. It does. Uh, final question because, before – go ahead. Go yeah, ahead. Well, just, just keep in mind, once that money's in that budget bill, everybody has their pet projects that they want. Some may want to see – an extra three hundred million to higher ed. Somebody may want to see more money going to corrections. Whatever the case may be, once that money is in the budget bill, it could be for some social welfare program. You name it. It is then much harder for the legislature to take it out of the budget bill. Eric, when you folks became then, but you folks, I mean Republicans, became the majority party in Charleston, there was a lot of talk about sweeping accounts. Have you been successful in doing that, in, in getting some of this uh, excess money that's been left over in budgets for years into the general fund? We, we've done a little bit uh, back and when we had our budget crisis in 14 is when we swept most of the accounts. But we haven't had to uh, sweep anything lately. I mean, by keeping a flatline budget, it's forcing them to spend their money. To, um, keep in mind, you have a general revenue and you have special revenue. Special revenue is about $2 billion. That's where a lot of the money is. But in order to get to that money, let the legislature would have to change the law. Remember, somebody at some point in time created a bill that allowed an agency to collect a fee, and then you created a special revenue account for that fee to go into. For instance, uh, when we passed a bill allowing fireworks, the sales of fireworks, uh, then allowed the state fire marshal to collect a fee and, and a certain percentage into that special revenue. but uh, And it just goes on and on and on. So you have about $2 billion just in special revenue that what I would consider a slush fund. Uh, but in order to get at it, to get at it, the legislature would have to go back in and either repeal certain sections of those special revenues, uh, repeal those bills, or, or modify them. So... And uh, you mentioned uh, August as a session. Is that a special session, Eric, or an interim session? If it is an interim session, but there but there has been talks that we will go into special session because of the six hundred and eighty one million dollars uh, surplus remaining. Remember, the legislature is always itching to spend money. That's what government does. They love to spend money. I love to give it back to you, and I'm doing everything I can to try to give as much of it back to you as quickly as I can. But uh, I'm only one person. <laughs> what are you hearing about a special session in terms of the timing of it, and uh, who's who's directing the uh, the special session? Well, the special the special session would be during the time that we were there for interims. Now there is conversations of like I stated earlier, and I also heard Senate President Blair mention on your show uh, last week, I believe it was, uh, money going towards corrections, money going towards volunteer fire department money going into the rainy day fund. So all these are still talks that are on the board and uh, nothing's been decided on yet. Uh, I know the house, we're going to have a uh, leadership meeting phone conversation this week and discuss some things. And then we'll have our majority whip go out and uh, start talking with the members and uh, we'll see what the flavor is. And we'll just go from there. And, and if we are in agreement, then the governor would call a special session, but they're not going to call a special session until the house and Senate, are both in agreement. Uh, Eric, you mentioned a couple so times about money going to the volunteer fire department. Uh, we mm -hmm. in Eastern Panhandle, and I suspect it's true throughout the state, find that the volunteers are not able to keep up with the increased traffic. They've got jobs of their own, even though they're very loyal, dedicated folks. But you need a transfusion, if you will, of some paid staff uh, to complement or uh, supplement uh, the volunteers. 
when you talk about vo money, the volunteer fire department, is any of that money targeted to the counties to start implementing a paid staff component, or is it all directed toward the volunteers themselves? Well, the fight seems to be right now, Bill, we have a certain mindset that wants to give all volunteer fire departments an equal amount. Uh, I'm from the mindset that says no. We ought to be giving more to growth counties who deserve more and to those counties who already have a fire uh, levy or a fire fee and who has an ambulance fee. There's a lot of counties that are refusing to pass a fire and ambulance fee, and that's their desire. But they shouldn't get the equal share or line share of the money if a county like Berkeley and Jefferson and Morgan, who have those fees, who need the, uh, the extra resources. So that's the fight right now. I don't know who's going to win out. I would like to see if we're going to go down this path of giving volunteer fire department more money. And remember, for your listeners, and it's always a big issue. In fact, last week in Metro News, there was another volunteer fire department, father, son, indicted for embezzlement. Uh, there's so much uh, fraud that happens throughout these volunteer fire departments, and the auditor's office catches them. And most of the time it's embezzlement. They're spending money. They're, you know where they shouldn't be spending money. And um, if we're going to go down this path, I want to make sure that growth counties uh, see a larger chunk of the money than counties who are refusing to pass a fire fee or, or dump or if they don't have a fire fee or an ambulance fee, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And we, I could end it, uh, okay, Bill. Sorry. We'll okay. give, kept Eric five minutes over when I promised him I'd let him go here. Eric, thanks so much for your time this morning. I do appreciate it. Yep. Thanks, guys. Anytime. We'll see Thanks, you. Have Eric. a great day. Take Have care. a great day. So that's uh, House Majority Leader Eric Householder.